Hallo allemaal, daar zijn we er weer. RHTV Live vanuit een onbekende locatie in ons mooie Nederland. Ja, goed. Morkje die heeft, uh, die is alweer in de koffer. Die is alweer in het schelden. Godverdomme nog hier, laat me eruit. Hoor je dat? Ja. Um, goed, zoals gezegd gaan we dus Adam Rice uitnodigen. Ik uh, even uitleggen dat ik uh, een stukje zou gaan vertalen. Van het Engels naar het Nederlands. Dat heb je zo net gezegd. Dus. Ja goed, dat had jij echt moeten doen. <laughs> goed, Brenda gaat dus uh, van alles vertalen. Zo. En we gaan hem nu even uitnodigen. Hello. Adam. All right. I'm just going to share this really quick. Okay, cool. And we can get started. Yeah. Okay. Just tell me when you're ready. Uh, all right. I am ready. Okay. So you are in America right now, right? Yes, I am. I'm and in the state of Maine. In the state of Maine, okay. Yes. And uh, you were, you were gone off to France. Yep. Uh, I spent about three and a half weeks there. I saw three of the big manifests and participated in a lot of other events with people there during the week. Um, we also still have two Americans that are in France currently. Uh, one man named uh, Robert Walton, who is from Utah, he is in Paris right now. And I'm told there is another gentleman uh, who's also from my state in the same city. Okay. So why did you go to France? Why did you so, want to see uh, them or something? Or, um... A few reasons. Uh, I wanted to help uh, the French uh, if I could. Um, I wanted to uh, learn from them. Uh, I also do uh, my own uh, independent journalism uh, through the Gilets Jaunes Yellow Vest movement. Uh, it became apparent very quickly how corrupt the media was. And we weren't seeing anything here. And when we did, it was just violence, destruction. And they were painting uh, the people in a, a way that it really just didn't seem true, uh, talking to many people online. Um, so I wanted to go there not only to be able to really explain and captivate the movement in a more accurate light, I, I wanted to be able to learn how to bring this home and, you know, whether there was unity over there or they had some secret uh, to these manifests. It's something we all really need uh, to get our power back. So that was really my main motivation uh, in going there was to learn, you know, how do we bring people together to affect social change uh, that can benefit everybody? Okay, Brenda will translate. Um, uh, Rogier vroeg... Um... Uh, waarom hij naar Frankrijk was gegaan. Uh, hij vertelde dat hij um, uh, huidig in Amerika zit, in Maine. En dat hij daar dus ook uh, actief is in, uh, met de Yellow Vest. Um, dat hij naar Frankrijk is gegaan uh, om uh, te leren van de Fransen. Of ze misschien een groot geheim hadden, waardoor, uh, waardoor de mensen uh, daar wel allemaal gezamenlijk naar buiten, gezamenlijk naar buiten gingen. Uh, waarom ze allemaal wel uh, met z'n allen in opstand kwamen. Uh, en uh, ja, hij heeft uh, een hele hoop dingen daar gezien en daar gaat hij zo nog, uh, nog vast wel wat over vertellen hoe zijn beleving er was. En dan zal ik dat dus door altijd even vertalen. Hij ging voornamelijk naar Frankrijk om, om, te, om ze te helpen en om van ze te doen. Oké, okay, uh, she just translated for me. Great. So, uh, so what did you see in France? Was, was it like very violent? What did you see? What was on the streets when so you were there? I, it, well, one thing uh, I would say first off is it's definitely different in different cities. So in Paris, I saw a lot of violence. Um, and it was typically, uh, I was only in Paris for one week. So in, in, that, in that one instance, I saw two different uh, manifests. 
uh, the first one uh, was more of a congregation in a, a area of a street near a park. Uh, there was a car in the middle of the road. They were playing Bob Marley. Everyone was dancing. They were singing. Uh, it was a very, very peaceful encounter. Uh, the police were just clo- kept the road closed off, and eventually they forced everyone out. They left willingly. So at that point, uh, all of the people moved to a different area where there was live music already going on. It was kind of like a rave. Um, it was not an illegal rave. Uh, there were street vendors. It was a very pleasant thing. Um, so when the uh, Gilets Jean congregated, they wanted to march again. So they did. Um, and we began to march down the street. And the police just started shooting the flash balls at the crowd from behind at their backs and it was at that point that everyone essentially dispersed and the arrests started happening and really everyone was uh continually forced out of the area with uh extreme aggression uh in paris if you go there now you you'll often see thousands of officers just continually patrolling it it appeared very much uh like a military occupation uh But then I went to the south afterwards. I spent some time in Marseille and their manifests. uh, There was violence at times, but there are so many pacifists there that it really the police kind of back off and just ensure that it's like corralling the uh, corralling the marchers. They're trying to keep them from continuing to march And they've employed this tactic of just turn around and march the other way. And the police just keep going back and forth, back and forth until eventually it just ends. Um, So it's definitely different in uh, each city. Um, Do you want to translate that before I go on more? Please, yes. Um, Now, he told that he was in Marseille and in Paris. En uh, dat er in uh, Parijs en, uh, dat er een verschil is tussen de steden, hoe de mensen daar protesteren en hoe er ook gereageerd wordt. Door met name de politie en andere dingen. Uh, in Parijs uh, vertelde hij dat het dus meer gewelddadiger is. En met name uh, de manier hoe de politie uh, reageert op uh, protesters en al die dingen. Uh, flashballs, dat die geschoten worden. Uh, hij vertelde een stukje dat er in, toen hij in Parijs was, dat hij, een week, hij was een week in Parijs. Uh, dat hij op een bepaald moment was er een, een, een verzameling van, van uh, gele ijsje, van Gilles de Jolt. En um, dat was iets gewoon lekker rustig, een beetje muziek. Ze speelden Bob Marley. Um, ja, dat ging gewoon heel gemoedelijk en er was verder niks aan de hand. En uh, ze wilden protesteren en uh, ja, uh, ze werden in de rug geschoten met uh, flashbombs, granaten, van die dingen. Uh, in Marseille ging het heel anders. Daar zijn... Uh, veel meer pacifistische uh, activisten en gele feestjes uh, die, uh, die protesteren op een andere manier. Uh, ze, die lopen weg uh, als de agenten hun insluiten, dan gaan ze de andere kant op. Dus dan zijn de agenten uh, drukker met heen en weer rennen als inderdaad met insluiten en opsluiten en arresteren. Um, ja, dat was het volgens mij. Ik dat het niet begrepen heb. Dus Adam, je kan je kunt continue. All right. so, uh... okay. Uh, another in- another uh, interesting thing uh, that I noticed uh, going between all of these different cities um, is that if my impression until I went there was that these people just popped up every Saturday, they marched, they went home, and that was it. That's all that they're doing is these marches every week. But uh, so much more work goes into uh, the organizing there than any of us really get to see. Uh, it, at least once a week, uh, these they're all congregating and having either picnics or food or social events because they believe that it is incredibly important to take time in person to talk and listen to each other. Uh, I found that in almost every city I went to, uh, they talked about how much people disagree with each other. And it sometimes takes the entire week to make sure everyone is still on the same page Saturday to go out and march in unison and not fight each other. 
So what was really important was to see that to get to where France is, is really like a full-time job and it takes a lot of compassion and understanding. Uh, and we have to share that to each other, despite our differences or where we came from or what we believe, because otherwise it, all we're doing is the legwork and we're not going to end up with the big margin, and the changes at the end of the road. Yeah. Oké, okay. hij uh, vertelde dat uh, de Fransen dat die dus bijna een hele week bezig zijn om mensen allemaal uh, ja, on the same page te noemen hij het. Uh, hij bedoelde, daar moet hij dan dus mee denk ik, uh, om soms de, neus de neuzen dezelfde kant ja. op, allemaal hetzelfde denken. Uh, of in ieder geval uh, zorgen dat mensen niet weglopen van de beweging. En uh, dat mensen zijn daar bijna 24-7 zijn ze daarmee bezig. En uh, daarmee voorkomen ze dus um, dat ze alleen maar één keer in de week lopen. Dat er inderdaad um, uh, de mensen hechter blijven. Dat ze meer uh, samenhang hebben. Uh, ja, en, en uh, dat de mensen die alleen de marsen zien, die zien dat natuurlijk ook nog niet. Van die dingen. So ja, dan ga ik heel erg veel steken. Jan? Ja. Uh, okay. One last uh, observation to kind of uh, add on to that is uh, all of the groups uh, throughout France, they're all numbered. Uh, and here in the USA, like we have our uh, area codes, uh, they have like the Gilets Jaunes group 13, 97, 75, and they operate on very small like city scales and they're broken up into all these little groups that have what they call a, a general assembly so outside of these like picnics and social gatherings they're also having weekly meetings to share ideas and uh, talk about how do we preserve the movement how do we keep people working together and the value of that really uh, is tied into what I was told was one of the number one rules is to never lose hope because if they lose hope, that's the end of it. So the general assemblies are incredibly important because that's what's giving people uh, the ability to keep their hope and feel like everyone is being heard. What <laughs> Um, she was asking me to translate, and I was like, no, you're the translator, <laughs> not me. <laughs> Giving me the shitty jobs. Thank you. Exactly. Hij <laughs> um, vertelde dat uh, het heel, um, in Frankrijk hebben ze een regel uh, dat ze uh, never lose hope, geen hoop, verliezen. hoop niet verliezen. En dat ze daar echt op blijven hameren, omdat dat, uh, als mensen hoop verliezen, dat, dat vernietigt de beweging. Dat is in het kort wat ik begrepen heb. So Adam, yours again. Okay, so, uh, well, I'll actually uh, take a question at this point. Yeah. Uh, if you have another one. A good friend of mine is asking if the, if the Americans are protesting with the yellow vests and, uh, and uh, how big is it there, you know? So what I would say is we've seen a lot of different things in America. <clears throat> we've seen... Uh, large marches for a single cause where there were lots of yellow vests and they marched, had speakers, it was successful. We've seen marches that were not in yellow vests that marched for a single cause and were successful. But then we've also seen at other times uh, in America where there are protests for a cause but the two groups that show up don't agree with each other and it, I have seen this to be problematic and something that can be overcome. But that's why I, I part of the reason I went to France was I really wanted to learn how is it when people clearly disagree on issues everywhere in the world, we're all human, we all function the same way in a different culture. Uh, how do they do this? And it seemed to me like the general assemblies were what was at least a factor and why their protests uh, don't seem to operate like ours. I never really saw groups uh, protesting and counter-protesting the way that they seem to here. 
and I think that's because they're doing a lot more off of the internet and they're taking the time to work through some of these differences and try and find some middle ground or compromise. Um, and I think that really stems from, you know, their idea with the Rick, which I'm sure we'll probably talk about at some point. Um, and it seems like there is a genuine, uh, a genuine desire to have a compromise uh, so that all of the people feel like they have their power, but are also getting enough of what they want um, through whatever comes of this. Um, that's my hope for in America here now being back is that we can find a way to actually bring people together and create solutions to the problems and focus a little bit less on the fact that they're there and when we can come together we can do anything and that's the important part is being together yeah no good um, <laughs> I've told heel Your veel. Over, ja, dank je. Hij vertelt heel veel over uh, hoe, 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 het, uh, hoe ze in Frankrijk uh, met elkaar verenigen. Dat ze eigenlijk buiten het internet om uh, samen samenkomen en uh, dus buiten de grote, grotere protesten dat ze dan inderdaad ook echt gewoon bij elkaar gaan zitten en dan gaan bespreken in plaats van zoals we dus in, het, in Nederland doen uh, op het internet en over de telefoon. Uh, dat maakt waarschijnlijk het grote verschil en ook het, het, uh, het betere succes van de protesten in Frankrijk. Um, uh, ze proberen uh, meningsverschillen een beetje in het midden te laten en elkaar toch tegemoet te komen. En um, door inderdaad gewoon met elkaar te gaan praten. Zo zouden wij het ook in Nederland moeten doen. Ja, ja dus alleen maar in Nederland hebben ze dan weer het probleem, niemand heeft geld en allemaal wonen ze weer weg en, en van al die dingen. Goed, misschien dat je het daar een regionale aan het pakken. Ja. So, um, uh, was this like the first time in France or did you ever go to France before this? No, uh, I've been to France actually several times. Uh, I've been to Paris maybe five times uh, more like as a tourist uh my sister lives there uh, i didn't get to see her on this trip because it didn't really the timing of where i was going to be didn't line up um but really to me this was a work trip you know i had a blast being there uh, everybody i met was uh, incredibly awesome and uh, they welcome their homes to myself uh, they're still offer opening their homes to robert uh, they've shown us everything. Uh, any request we had was uh, granted. They bought us food. It, 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 they're truly awesome people. Um, it, but for me, uh, it, it was it was work. Uh, it was work I love. But uh, it, it, I didn't go there to see the sights or visit the museums. It, it, it was uh, all work, no play. I understand. Oké, okay, um, hij vertelde dat uh, hij uh, wel meerdere keren naar Frankrijk is gegaan, uh, maar dat hij deze keer dus naar Frankrijk gegaan was om echt iemand te helpen. En dat hij daar met open armen ontvangen werd, hij kreeg eten van, ze hadden op slapen, hij, uh, dus alles, alles wat ze vroegen, daar probeerden ze mee te helpen. Nou, ja. mooi toch? Ja. Um, <coughs> ja, heeft iemand die meekijkt een vraag aan Adam? Over uh, de protesten in Frankrijk of over uh, de protesten in Amerika. So um, I sent you a, a, a film about the French Revolution and you saw that. So how did you how did you feel when when you saw that that part of history? Well, honestly, I really I feel like we're repeating it. I, I don't know if we're doing it in reverse or the same way uh, it happened last time, uh, but this is definitely a pattern that seems to reoccur even further back than just the American and the French revolutions. Uh, eventually, power gets to be too consolidated in either one person or a group, and the people have to take it back. Um, and it seemed like back then there were a lot of people who – had insurmountable odds to accomplish what they did, but they did. 
uh, in both in France and here. And it took, it seems like the same thing that's happening now, people going back and forth, <laughs> learning from each other, sharing ideas. And, uh, it, you know, it's a different situation in a different time now, but there's a lot to be learned. Uh, and you've reminded me of this a few times, just to go back and look in the history books of how they did it the last time. Exactly. History repeats in different ways. So did they? Uh, did they? Oh, sorry. Did they have any results in France um, uh, for the people? Did they have any improvements or um, by the protests? Uh, I mean, did they? I would say that perhaps about right. Did they accomplish anything? The the, the, the yellow with the vests pro with the protests. Did they accomplish anything? I I believe they are accomplishing things. Um. As far as specifics, I would say they definitely do have uh, still things that are on the list to accomplish. Um, we have a few people in the chat, I believe, actually from France who might be able to answer that a little bit better. Um, I would say confidently they are heading towards victory one way or another. Um, but, you know, like with every movement, you'll gain a couple inches and there's setbacks. Uh, while I was there, I saw quite a few setbacks, but nobody seemed to lose hope. They took it as a new obstacle and they were determined and are determined to overcome as many as they need to, to keep going. Uh, one of the biggest ones, uh, and I, I've seen this here, too, is the perpetual uh, media saying, oh, everyone's losing hope. Everyone's going home. It's it's dwindling down. But they all laugh when, when you're out there on Saturday, you see the thousands of people on the street and they're like, oh, yeah, like we're it's really going away. And uh, it, they mentioned uh, a bunch of people mentioned to me in different cities how much the French view their humor and it seems like when things like that happen, they have a way of laughing at it and just empowering each other to fight harder. And, uh, okay. you know, and I'm sure that's just another thing that's repeating itself from history. You kind of have to find a way to bring some joy and light back into that kind of thing. Some jokes sometimes and, and exactly. act like an idiot. Well, you know and this. We know how to act like an idiot. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. We just had an interview with our with our very special guest, Mark. Our special puppet. Yeah. Here he is. I just uh, showing you. He's also wearing a, a vest, as you can see. <laughs> this, is a, this is the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. Yeah. <laughs> so. That's too funny. We actually had a talk with the Prime Minister of the Netherlands and uh, yeah, the Dutch oh vests. wow, yeah, the Dutch yellow vest had a talk and uh, and well, he just shit through the media all over the yellow vest. <laughs> well, yeah. He did, yeah. And there's going to be a, an, another um, interview or conversation with him after election. So I don't know any day it could happen again. How are the and media? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I was just I was just reading that too. Um, so I actually had a couple different experiences with the media. Um, at the manifests in Paris, uh, you'll always see there's RT there. There's a bunch of media outlets, and they're always running these live streams. This is happening. Um, they have a reporter that the, the one week I was in Paris that was definitely interviewing people a bit. Um, and the way it was explained to me is that oh, you'll probably see a few seconds of what of the questions asked and then the rest is the people at the desk talking. Um, I, and I got to go on a special trip uh, with some of the Alliance John in Paris. Um, and we went around this whole day to a bunch of different sites. Uh, they were doing uh, some of their like pit, they kind of like merged an assembly with a picnic. So uh, they go to one place, they'd have food, then everybody would discuss, debate a little bit, and then they'd have more food. And the they had a couple of independent uh, journalists who followed us the whole day. Um, and then I think it was at the third location we went to, they had a couple of the bigger outlets 
uh, filmed another like debate session. Um, but I, I never got to see any of those videos. So I don't really know how much actually made it onto TV out of the whole day. Um, but we did have the pleasure uh, that evening of sitting with the two independent journalists and I got to ask them a few questions and they, uh, they explained that it's the same thing there. Like everywhere else, the big media outlets don't want to cover it at all. And if they do, it's like, they're filling this agenda of how do we help you stop this? Um, and I'm sure that probably has something to do with them being in the sights of the gilet around the world. Um, and they probably want to protect themselves the way the government does. Um, naturally I can't, I can't speak for them. Um, but as an independent journalist, um, I've seen the other side of that, you know, the network of people who see that problem and want to step in and fill that void with truth. Um, so, you know, the French have been right there from the beginning with, uh, like the media independent gilet jaune. Uh, that idea has always existed in this movement, that whatever it takes, we will make sure that the truth is always going to be out there and that the people can find it. Now, Ben, do your work. Um, <laughs> I was listening. Shit. <laughs> um... <laughs> Hij vertelde een stukje, het laatste wat ik meegekregen heb, omdat ik aan het luisteren was, uh, goed, uh, een stukje over uh, hoe de media uh, de Yellow Vests uh, behandelt. En uh, dat het eigenlijk overal hetzelfde is, um, dat uh, de, de, de problemen waar ze in Frankrijk en in Amerika tegenaan lopen, met de media... Ze geven een negatieve beeldvorming. Ja, yeah, ik heb een negatieve image of the Yellow Vests. En, yeah. um, dat het eigenlijk in elk land uh, hetzelfde is en um, goed, uh, dat mensen in ieder geval geen hoop mogen verliezen en dat ze dan voor moeten blijven gaan, want de waarheid die is ergens en die komt altijd op boven. En mensen zoals Adam en uh, zoals Rogier en andere mensen die zorgen toch wel dat de waarheid eruit komt en dat ze dat mede gaan delen, dat ze dat aan mensen gaan vertellen, dat ze het laten zien en dat zal gebeuren. Goed, of de media daar nou mee werkt of niet, de waarheid blijft de waarheid. Ja. Ja. So, um, are the are the yellow vests in Maine uh, active? Like, yeah, and uh, and this was a, another interesting thing uh, that I kind of learned and observed while I was there. Uh, in America, like we have a much stronger presence of like boots on the ground anonymous activists that are not just like the Yellow Vest. Uh, the goal is to not be political, um, to kind of be outside the box um, and to try and unify everyone to better things for everyone. So like in my state, uh, I've had a much more successful turnout uh, through anonymous groups in the northeastern uh, U.S., uh, really getting a lot of people to come out and doing it peacefully uh, with speakers. We feed people uh, and we turn it into something that benefits the community at the end. Um, but then it, like I go to you look at New Jersey, they've had really successful yellow vest uh, protests and Texas has had a bunch. Uh, Colorado goes out every week um so it, you know it depends on the state whether you're gonna see more yellow vests or more anonymous or it, other movements um it we're uh, a lot bigger than france so the way they uh like explained it to me is you have like a ton of people in a much smaller area so it does make it a bit easier to uh get everybody out in the yellow vests we're here we're really spread out, so it takes a, a bit of a different effort that we're, I think, still kind of figuring out, but like uh, wrapping yeah. our heads around it. Sorry, yeah, don't make them so long. <laughs> Sorry, sure to remember and translate. Um, uh, I've told him, um, that uh, I ook uh, in, in zijn plaats and in andere plaatsen in America, uh, that there's a little um, stuk makkelijker. 
uh, Yellow Vest op de straten te krijgen zijn, omdat ook een gedeelte anonymous erbij zit en mensen ja. die anonymous mannen en dat die um, dan zich dan makkelijker verenigen en uh, naar buiten gaan om uh, te protesteren. Um, de wet, uh, Adam, there was uh, asked the question here if you would be willing to come to the Netherlands sometimes. I would love to. I actually, uh, I had initially intended to um, come for the protest you guys just went to, uh, but quite a few things were going on back in my city that uh, my family needed me for, so I had to leave uh, a little earlier than I had planned. Um, but that's. Uh, It's on my goal list to make another trip over there for this thing and uh, this time bring my wife so we can do some sightseeing in places we haven't gone together yet. Oké. Okay. Okay. Nou, ja. hij vertelde dat, dat het nog op zijn lijstje staat om een keer naar Nederland te komen. Met zijn vrouw. Met zijn vrouw. En dat hij ook dan inderdaad ook echt dingen in Nederland kan gaan zien, zoals Amsterdam en zo. Ik gok de koffieshops. En. Uh... Ik denk het ook. Ik denk het wel. Maar uh, goed, uh, van die dingen, uh, die toeristenplekjes, er zijn een paar museums en andere dingen. En goed, dat wil hij nog wel een keer doen. Maar het staat nog op zijn lijstje. Hij moest, uh, op zijn planning stond dat hij inderdaad naar Rotterdam uh, wilde komen. Maar uh, vanwege familieomstandigheden, dat hij eerder terug moest gaan naar Amerika. Heb je ever been to the Netherlands before? I have once as a kid, uh, my family, uh, we went to Amsterdam uh, as, I, God, I must have been in elementary school. Um, I've always wanted to go back. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, I, def I, I just need to. I, I really want to see all of Europe, Germany, Spain, Ireland. There's, uh, there's Ireland, so yeah, much yeah. history there. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have a lot uh, do you have a lot of connections with uh, worldwide uh, yellow vests all, all the countries uh, yellow uh, uh, Ireland Sweden uh, England yeah. England so uh, I actually have connections actually in England through a few a few different uh, networks at this point uh, be between uh, anonymous uh, the yellow vests now and the natural medicine community uh the uk's uh we there's a lot of people there uh very active um also uh gilet jean of the world uh that has really been my favorite uh network for connecting with people um in all these different countries um it's very hard to actually have like regular conversations with everybody but uh I believe last I checked, there was at least 70 countries in there with many more supporting. Um, the uh, other country I have actually worked with uh, in the past few months was this uh, Sudan. Um, we uh, had a woman come to us uh, and explain that in December, they had their own revolution that started. And they had been out this whole time uh, overthrowing dictator after dictator after dictator. Um, and last I checked, they're still out there uh, fighting uh, more violently than the, G uh, the uh, Gilets Jaunes are. Uh, they are, I believe, from what I understand, peaceful protesters that are actually being shot at with bullets um, and still attempting to stay pacifist to the best of their ability. Um, so that, uh, outside of France has been, uh, I guess the biggest project of this nature that I've engaged in this year. Okay. Hij vertelde dat hij contact heeft gehad met, uh, uh, nee. uh met, met activisten in Sudan, Sudan. En, uh, ja, daar liggen ze veel heviger onder vuur, vertelde hij, uh, inderdaad, dat er met live bullets geschoten wordt, met gewoon op scherm. Uh, en dat ze hun best doen om zo lang mogelijk pacifistisch te blijven. Dus zonder geweld, geweldloos. Um, en dat dat ontzettend moeilijk is uh, voor die mensen. En dat is eigenlijk het, een soort van project waar die mee bezig nu op dit moment is. Dat is de strijd voor hun. Dat is hun battle, you know. En ja. Uh, yeah. yeah, This is a world wide thing. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that's, you know, that's been my vision from the start of this. You know, when I first saw this, it was 
a Facebook video, like, holy, wow, that's happening in France right now. Um, and more countries started saying, hey, we have those problems too. Maybe we should be doing that. And it seems like, you know, this, uh, the division, uh, the media manipulation is active everywhere in the world. So as each country is trying to organize to, you know, fix the same problems, we're also facing the same problems. So uh, it's, it seems like every country is taking a unique road uh, to the same end. And, you know, my vision from the get go has been the whole world doing this because I want to fix the whole world like together, hand in hand, like everybody can fix all of these problems. If we can get to that point uh, of, you know, getting past fighting each other or getting past you know, propaganda on the news or the internet and, or, you know, the limitations that come with using Facebook as an organization tool um, or censorship, uh, you know, and, and I think anyone in the world would hear these things and be like, yep, that's happening to us too. Uh, because, you know, there's a playbook that the other side will operate out of. And that's just like you say, history. It repeats itself. In exactly. the Netherlands, we have different kind of protests, and I I actually made a picnic in Arnhem, and I also made uh, space cakes, and I had uh, three boxes of space cakes, and I had the police watching me give people space cake at the protest. <laughs> we had we had lots of fun. It was very. It was just like a gathering and connecting people and, and I made some food and, and we were peeling potatoes until four o'clock in the morning and at seven we had to get up and, and make the protest and stuff like that. But that was so, you know. It, it was very hard work. Yeah. Um, it, it wasn't a big gathering, but uh, there were more than 100 people. But um, yeah, it, it, the protests in the Netherlands aren't as big as in France. Maybe it's because we're not connecting. Yeah, food connects people. Well, we're not really connecting with each other like, like in France, you know. They have a gathering over there where people, you know, actually see each other. And, well, and, and, and you know, one thing, one thing that I kind of noticed too is, you know, I don't necessarily need to go and say, hey, they're doing this. So we need to do the exact same thing. You know, we can learn from what they're doing and apply like the same reasoning to our situation. And, and that's what I think is the most important is understanding that when they accomplish certain things, it has a certain benefit. So if we can find a way to accomplish those things, you know, in our cities, in our states, that that can have the same effect that it has had on the like the French. Yeah, people over here in the Netherlands they use uh, different ideas. The, the, this protest is is more kind of like music, and uh, the other protest is more like giving information. The other protest, uh, I made I made a picnic. Uh, other people do barbecues. Um, what else do they do? Uh, they make uh, little coffee stops uh, at, at highways and, and stuff and they give people some coffee or tea and, and talk to people, give them information. Yeah. They do that also. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's all different kind of ideas and everyone who organizes one um, makes it their own ideas, uh, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so I see there's a question in here. Uh, do the USA uh, Yellow Vest use social media a lot? and the French. Um, so to answer that question uh, for Hendelson, uh, in the USA, yes, immensely. There is, I would say, everything is really being done on some form of social media right now. And the contrast between that and the French is they're making sure everything is almost like backed up in the real world. Uh, they're using apps like Telegram or Discord to try and do as much off of Facebook as they can. Uh, and it appears that Facebook is really serving more of the purpose of like video sharing 
showing each other what the other cities are doing. And I think that it, it, conscious or not, they're empowering each other with just the video sharing. And to actually organize, uh, they understand that the most effective way is to actually find connections and talking in, in the real world. Yeah. Um, now, I know Barry knows English, but I'll translate anyway. Uh, hij vertelde dat inderdaad uh, de video sharing op Facebook bijvoorbeeld, dat is wel om elkaar te inspireren, om te laten zien wat, wat, ze, uh, wat ze doen. Uh, maar dat ze zoveel mogelijk proberen om buiten Facebook om uh, contact te leggen via Discord of Telegram of uh, andere apps. En, um, maar voornamelijk ook echt gewoon in het echt meeten en... Uh, dat was het, dus het antwoord ongeveer voor de mensen die geen Engels kunnen. Oké. Okay. Uh, well, uh, next question. Do you have any questions for the Dutch? Say that. Say. Do you have any questions for Dutch yellow vests? Because we're we are Dutch yellow vests, you know. And there are a lot well, of I, yellow. Uh, well, Brenda, I've talked to you a bit about uh, your prank protests, um, and I know I'm familiar with that, but the uh, pranks you, you like to do at times, um, and I think, you know, I, I tell a lot of people about that because that's an idea that I didn't really see in France, but I think could be really uh, effective um, at keeping peaceful tactics on the table. Um, so maybe for the other viewers in America and France, maybe you could uh, tell a little bit about that. Uh, you mean the the the, the donuts fishing? Yeah, like the don't like the donuts and that that kind of, that kind of thing. Okay, I I walked a small protest in uh, I organized a small protest in Arnhem. It's a very small yeah a small city, and um, the police uh, told me. When I uh, uh, lose the gliders, uh, uh. <laughs> uh, you have to have some people who act like sort of police during the protest. And uh, the police ordered me to make them recognizable for them. So I made some sticks with a little string on them and I put a donut on them and I made them watch the donut. And <laughs> I gave random people donuts, so I thought we're going to behave, so watch the donuts. Uh, after that, I um, made um, the, the police here in the Netherlands had a protest and they compared their jobs or their people to uh, uh, dried out lemons. And so I put dried out blue lemons on, on, on my fishing poles. And uh, in between that, I went to The Hague, and uh, the police in The Hague are um, they're more violent than the other police because of the, the, the idiots who run this country. Yeah, they, um, wait, 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 let me tell you and then I'll go to The So I went to The Hague, and people yeah, got a little bit violent with the police, or the police with the people. And after that, I put pig, pig's ears on my fishing poles. <laughs> and I walked through Arnhem with pig's ears. And stuff like that. Uh, we, we, in, in Arnhem, we uh, had a picnic in a park. And there was a big, it was with, who uh, said that was Liberation Day? Liberation Day, yeah. Uh, it was on uh, May 5th. And um, the park we were picnicking in had a big, huge bell. It was in the middle of the water, and I asked people, I said, can somebody ring this bell? There was a, a fine on it for a thousand euros, and I, I asked people, I said, ring this bell, please ring this bell during the protest. At the end of the protest, ring this bell, it needs to ring. And someone had to swim over to the bell, but we, we, they, we tried, they tried to make a little string on, on, uh, on the bell so we could pull it from the side, but it, it didn't work. But, yeah, I would have. That would have been very, very stuff cool. Stuff like that, it comes to mind, and yeah, annoying things. It, it, uh, take the scent of a dog in heat and annoy the dogs if they're at, at protests, whatever. There's stuff like little whistles so that was, uh, yeah, electronic gadgets, amplify them, stuff like that. Yeah, 
it's just thinking out sure. loud and coming <clears throat> up with ideas. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it looks like there's a question here that maybe we both could answer. Uh, did you strike with tension between the police? Uh, are they nice to you or not? Um, here in America, I would say it would depend on the protest and the tactics used. Uh, you could look at Standing Rock or oil protesters or Occupy and see like the same kind of violence we saw in Paris. Um, but then you could also see, you know, different marches uh, where people obtain the permits and uh, do everything by the book. And at those sorts of events, the police will basically escort you and keep the protesters safe, uh, provided that it doesn't get rowdy. Um, so maybe uh, you could tell me and uh, the viewers here, uh, what are the, is it like that uh, with uh, the Netherlands, uh, are, are they always nice or are they sometimes not nice? Um, we have different kinds of police in, in The Hague, they are not so nice. Uh, but like in Arnhem, I had conversations with the chief of police, uh, with somebody from the city hall. And I, I didn't want to speak with him on the phone. I said, I'll make an appointment with you. Can we speak in, in person? And I just told him, I want to make this protest and what are the rules and tell me so we can start discussion. And I had no problem. I, the, the, the chief uh, of the police in, in Arnhem even um, switched. switched his um, uh, day off to be at the protest because I had every time conversations with him. So he made sure he was at the protest and not somebody else. It, wow. it was just it depends on how, how you interact with with police and, and how they um, treat you. I think it, it, it differs in, in all sorts of cities. I had a nice encounter with the police, uh, no problems at all. And I even I even shared cupcake and uh, space cakes with everyone while he was watching me. Right. It's like that. Yeah. I had no problems. Yeah, I had a one person explain to me, <clears throat> like in Paris, uh, they have different types of police too, um, all throughout France. And like the the really violent ones in Paris are, uh, it's mostly military police who are all paid on a salary. So no matter what they endure, how many hours they are at work, they don't get paid anything extra. So it's almost like they're putting the angriest police in the city where you're seeing the most violence from the police but then you go to like a different city where it's uh police officers who are paid hourly and they don't it seems like they don't mind letting them march a bit longer you'll still see the violence but uh they're gonna get paid more if the march goes on longer so it's kind of in their benefit to uh keep keep the order but they don't seem to be just crazy for lack of a better word um and i think that's definitely a, a huge factor here too is you know uh if you get paid no money for work or or you're not getting paid what you're owed you're going to be pissed off too and the system is definitely screwing the police and it seems like in many cases there, they're taking it out on the protesters and not also saying, hey, like, what are you doing? Like, stop. Like, let's all just stop. That's because they'll lose their job if they start at, at the people who, uh, yeah. It's, it's the same in the Netherlands. The, some police agree with the yellow vests, but they're not allowed to join them. Otherwise, they'll lose their job. And uh, and, uh, a person here, uh, Hendelson Barry, said uh, medics say some cops are on drugs. Uh, I can confirm that. Um, I spent some time uh, with a woman who was a retired police commissioner and uh, was told directly from her that when the hash is imported to France from Africa, it comes through uh, cartels in the south of France 
And those cartels are not being busted, uh, really, by the police nearly as much as the people uh, just smoking weed. Uh, and I don't consider weed or hashish really to be a drug, but uh, the police are taking that and smoking it. Her exact words were, I always got the best hash when I was still working for the police because we could just take it from people. Uh, and... I don't know as much. I'm sure the medics probably have way more uh, experience uh, seeing things like that. Um, but I, I, straight from the horse's mouth, that is that there is a lot of corruption going on in the police there, just like here at home. I've I've seen it. Our government created the crack epidemic in Cal in California, um, so it's. Uh, I, we really shouldn't be surprised by that allegation, I don't think. Exactly. Yeah. There were like articles of, uh, of, I believe it was a plane that crashed somewhere in Florida with, with lots of cocaine on it and, and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Oh, yeah, or like boats that get busted and then it all just vanishes. Oh, where did it go? We don't know. <laughs> Yeah, the mice we don't know, Adam. We don't know. No, no idea. Uh. Right. But uh, and I, I, I do want to thank uh, thank Henderson and Elsis for uh bringing up the medics. Uh, I followed them for two weeks in the south of France, and uh, I learned a lot how uh, they also operate. Uh, their medics were white. Uh, they operate under unequivocal neutrality between black blocks, yellow vests. They don't engage the police uh, and they try and keep uh, the neutrality so they can move around freely at the manifest and be allowed to treat people who are injured. Um, and it's really in everyone's best interest to maintain that. Um, and they're often putting themselves between the protesters and the police at the most tense moments. And I, many of them told me they've been hit by rubber bullets in the process of just trying to help somebody. Um, so, you know, those guys really do deserve a pat on the back because, uh, like the way it was explained to me is that the medics serve a huge role because people, uh, uh, gain a sense of security and safety knowing there is a strong medic presence at an event like that. Um, and when they have that, they feel much more comfortable risking, you know, the danger that there is it, things like that. Um, and, you know, it's really sad to see the people helping the injured getting hurt. Uh, but, you know, seeing that inspired me to want to do the same thing. Um, because, you, it, you know, that, it's a you solid, you know, it's a solution. Did you ever like get hurt or like have a bruise or whatever? You so know? Uh, I didn't get hurt. Um, I, I would say I came pretty close. Um, at the first uh, manifest I went to in Marseille, uh, I was told they had been trying to go into the train station and march inside and sing their songs for six months. And every time they got close, the police would gas them so they couldn't get in there. Um, and this time they happened to succeed. So we, we got in there, we were singing, uh, all the regular people were cheering them on. It's, it was it was pretty funny in my opinion until uh the police came and started you know beating people and getting really pushy and hostile uh i was filming at the time i had my yellow vest on that said press um they threw me up against a wall like let me search your bag this and that they took my helmet um and they shut my camera off and i just threw my hands up and said i i speak english i'm press uh, they, they, all right, we won't hurt you. Just go outside, get out of here. Um, so I did and I wasn't hurt. Somebody else was at the time, but, uh, the police let the medics go right through and treat the injured. Um, and they, they did seem at least in that city to have a really good working relationship with the medics. And, uh, 
even though it seemed like the medics d definitely don't like what the police were doing, uh, they were still putting effort into maintaining that working relationship because it's very necessary for everyone. There's a question here. How is your, your restriction in the USA when you are involved in protest? Will they use it against you and won't give you prop uh, paper to prove of good behavior when you want to get visa okay um so uh that would depend on the state um so for example our state south dakota it's now illegal to protest uh, against oil pipelines um other states are also passing uh, at least attempting to pass laws to make just protesting completely illegal jailable with a fine um, they have not, as far as I know, succeeded in many of those attempts yet. Um, but typically, uh, there are arrests made at protests. Oftentimes, it would be because somebody was rowdy and hit someone or they broke something or uh, they were, you know, maybe you drinking in public. Uh, it would be because they did something else. Um, outside of that um and to lose your ability to travel to another country uh that's really only for felonies so like if you were a protester and you burned a car and got caught then absolutely they you would lose that right um but a person uh you know holding a sign uh being respectful um would definitely i would say most most times would not be arrested unless it was in a state where it's now illegal to do that Okay. okay, that's uh, that's quite creepy that the government uh, says you're not allowed to protest anymore. You know, the, the well, kind of looks like a dictatorship, you know? It, it, yeah, well, you know, I, I felt we looked like a dictatorship before that started to happen. Um, uh, my my thought is is that they must obviously know what's happening in France. They must obviously know everybody's waking up and wants the same thing here. Um, and you know, what do you do? You try and pass laws to prevent it or make money off of it. You know, you look at the uh, like look at the tactics used in war. You know, so many of these groups can profit off of both sides of a war. So if you set it up so you can find people every time they protest, even if they don't do anything other than find you, they're just making money off you now. And they're turning your right to, you know, have uh, your freedom of speech into just a, another loophole. Uh, they're going to take money from people or, you know, throw you in a private prison for profit. Um, you know, it, it that hole can keep going down further and further until we start climbing out of it. Um, but the U.S. is, you know, it's different than other states. I mean, other countries, from what I understand, like, like in France, you know, the laws are pretty similar throughout the whole country. But here in like in the U.S., you have federal laws, but then 50 different states with different state laws. And that's how our country was set up. So, uh, you know, like my state, it's written really easy on protesters, you know, like pot's legal. Like we, we do pretty good about actually making like some small steps in the right direction. But then you could see other states where it's like tooth and nail at a standstill and they're, they really need to fight the system, you know, be harder or sooner or differently perhaps. Um, and, you know, I, I think the end road is like every state will see the same outcome, but I don't think it, it's happening the same way in the same places because we're all different. That's very true. That's true. So, uh, I guess the interview is over, huh? Almost. <laughs> yeah. I don't have any questions anymore. Would you do uh, another interview maybe next week or in two weeks or whatever? So we can. Whenever. Yeah, absolutely. Concerns and, and stuff. Uh, somebody before uh, commented, uh, you should do this every week uh, so people stay informed about other countries. So if we Honestly, I think it's, it's really good because, um, you know, it seems like all of our countries have people doing it in our country of, you know, just more like replacing our own news. But uh, it's like, this is like the international. 
You are <laughs> like the muse. The, yeah. Remember but, uh, that. You are the muse. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but like things like this are really cool because like when we like we've got France in the comment section and two other countries on video right now, you know, like all learning from each other. So, you know, the more we can do that, it, for me, it doesn't matter about the viewers. This can be shared everywhere endlessly now. But like this experience and like sh like sharing like this in the comment section with people really can show more of that coming together and uh, that same uh that same thing you know like taking something that the french are succeeding that's at and... that's what we need we need to come together doesn't matter what color exactly. you are or whatever we all have the same type of blood it's and red absolutely so yeah hey and, and yeah. thank you for, for thank you time. for uh for your time and uh, effort and stuff like that. No, absolutely. And thank you guys. And we will talk again soon. I'll, yeah. I'll send, uh, send you to Marco Drikki. Maybe he wants to do an yes. interview with you. Oh, I would I'll love to. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll go ask, ask him and uh, no He's problem. probably watching anyway, so. Uh... <laughs> so you'll probably see Great. this. Yeah. Well, well, if you are, send me a message. I am happy to do this with anyone. Uh, if there are more questions for a different video, uh, happy to do that. Um, I have plenty of my own opinions and hypotheses to solve things here in our country. Um, and most of all, it's just a pleasure to work with other people to try and solve this problem plaguing all of us. It's a pleasure to talk to you, my friend. It's, it's been a while, so uh, yeah, we'll keep in well. contact. Yeah. Always. We'll keep in contact. Always. Okay. Have a Stay good safe. night, you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Nou, goed. Ik ga even theewater afmaken, maar wil goed. Ja, ja, dat is goed. Ja, jullie hebben het gehoord. Hè? Bren heeft het merendeels vertaald. En ja, uh, yeah. it's, it's always nice to watch uh, the, the, the people connect with each other. You know, doesn't matter where you're from, whether you're from Africa or whether you're from Asia or America or Europe or whatever country, we're all human. We all have the same blood, and we all have the same problem, which is a government that is totally out of control. So thank you for watching, and we'll see each other next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.